Good morning, everyone. I think we can now get started. Um, my name is Madeline McCready. I'm project manager working at NSL, one of the partners in the SIA project. I'd like to welcome you today to the SIA midterm webinar and thank you for attending. Together, the, SIA, the partners of the SIA project, we will go through the various aspects of the system that is being developed and our achievements so far. SIA involves the development of a system to monitor the health status of the most demanding railway vehicle infrastructure assets in terms of maintenance costs at the point of interaction between the vehicle and the infrastructure, such as the wheel set, pantograph, rail and catenary. Using European global, global navigation satellite systems, precise and highly available positioning is made available to our system. To start with, I'll go through the agenda for this event and some brief points on how you can participate in this webinar. Madeline, um, it's Michael from DLR. Perhaps we should wait another minute or two for uh, the list of participants to, to fill a bit more. Okay. If that is okay with everyone. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah, I see now. Um, I think we've got a few people joining. So we are a bit behind schedule, but I think it's nice to see such uh, great interest. And should, shall you, should you perhaps start, Maddy? Yes, yes. Good morning, everyone. To start with, I'll go through the agenda for the event and some brief points on how you can uh, participate in the webinar today. Um, firstly, I'll pass over to our project officer at the GSA, Daniel Rapor, who's kindly agreed to say a few words on the project from the GSA perspective. Following this, um, our coordinator, uh, Unai Alvarado from CIT, will provide an overview of the SIA project. Uh, the floor will then be passed over to my colleague, Rami Moradi from NSL, and Michael Roth from DLR on the SIA onboard and offline positioning systems that have been developed and the benefits that European Genesis is bringing. Following this, Michael Roth and Benjamin Bach from DLR will cover the subsystem that monitors the health of the interaction between the wheel and the rail. And the floor will then be passed over to Unai again, who will detail the system that monitors the health um, of the interaction between the pantograph and the catenary. Following this, um, Jose Manuel Martin from Engine Control will explain and show the SIA visualization platform that has developed, been developed. And then last, not but la last but not least, we'll have a 20 minute Q&A session to hopefully answer all of your questions today. Uh, there may also be the opportunity to ask some questions after each speaker's presentation. Um, this is time dependent, hopefully um, we can st stick to our schedule today.
I'm going to go through a few points on how you can participate in the event. Uh, one just kind point, if you could please keep your microphone and camera off if you're not speaking and um, sort of avoid any uh, background noise. And then my second point um, is in the participants tab at the bottom of your screen, you can edit your identity um, if it is not shown properly in Zoom. Um, sometimes it, it doesn't initially. And then we please encourage you today to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, please use the chat fun function within Zoom to log your question. I'll be monitoring the chat module throughout the session and all questions will be answered by the end of the webinar. Furthermore, this webinar is being recorded today and it will be uploaded to the SIA website after the event. If it's okay, um, I'll now pass over to Daniel Lafour, our project officer at the GSA, who will say a few words. Okay, good morning, everybody. I hope that uh, we can hear each other. Is it the case? <laughs> Yes, yes, it works very well. Yes. Okay, yes, okay. We fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, so I will be uh, very brief. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, inviting me to this uh, important webinar. Uh, uh, it is a, a pleasure for our agency that we can uh, uh, work together with you and uh, um, uh, share uh, the common objectives uh, 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 in the market uh, uh, segment of rail. Um, our agency is uh, uh, responsible for uh, the development, um, uh, operation, uh, promotion and also security of uh, uh, the two uh, European uh, GNSS uh, systems, uh, uh, EGNOS and Galileo. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a task that uh, we are holding already for uh, uh, several years. Uh, but uh, in the future, uh, it is the case that uh, we will be also uh, um, working on some aspects uh, of uh, uh, Earth observation, uh, taking over uh, particular tasks of uh, uh, the Copernicus system. And uh, uh, for that, uh, uh, the agency is also going to uh, uh, bear another name in the future, uh, the uh, European uh, agency, Union Agency for uh, Space Systems, so uh, EUSPA. And uh, uh, we are still a couple of months uh, from that, uh, however, uh, in um, uh, we are on the track uh, to uh, make this important change. Uh, uh, despite uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, still ongoing tasks uh, and uh, running projects uh, uh, within Horizon 2020, we are also focusing on uh, the future uh, within the upcoming uh, Horizon Europe program. And uh, 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 the projects uh, uh, that uh, we are funding, including SIA, are all uh, very carefully selected uh, state-of-the-art uh, projects taking into uh, account the latest development in the technology uh, uh, in case of uh, all the market segments uh, uh, that are um, actually um, uh, uh, currently in the focus uh, uh, of the market development department of the GSA. So uh, to be more concrete uh, in case of uh, the railway uh, uh, domain, um, our main focus still remains in the safety critical part of uh, uh, the applications, which is uh, um, a very uh, delicate topic, as uh, most of you uh, know, uh, highly regulated environment and uh, without constant push and uh, uh, um, uh, involvement of uh, not only the GSA, but also the European Space Agency and Shift to Rail uh, and uh, other stakeholder groups, uh, um, uh, the topic of GNSS will be only very hard to uh, reach the final objective. Objective, uh, which is uh, the penetration of uh, the European rail traffic management system uh, where GNSS could really uh, deliver uh, uh, what it uh, aims to do, uh, uh, that is uh, to be the game changing uh, technology uh, able to uh, significantly improve uh, uh, operational aspects and reduce the cost uh, uh, of uh, ERTMS. So uh, this is still uh, a long way to go. Um, uh, however, uh, there are also other parts 
parts of the segment which are less safety critical, uh, like the one on which the SIA project is focusing. Uh, uh, so, for example, projects where GNSS could uh, um, uh, improve uh, uh, within its uh, unique uh, performance char characteristics uh, the accuracy of uh, positioning, and uh, uh, this can be used also in the applications that uh, uh, require these aspects uh, uh, in order to perform um, uh, in the expected way to serve the needs of the customer. Uh, we have uh, uh, already several achievements uh, uh, as the agency in this regard. Uh, one of the latest ones is uh, the announced uh, <clears throat> deployment of uh, European GNSS in the entire Prague uh, light rail tramway uh, network uh, uh, for uh, uh, infrastructure management purposes, uh, uh, but uh, also in relation with the uh, uh, customer uh, or passenger information systems. So uh, more than 800 Prague trams uh, uh, that are operated uh, within the quite extensive uh, uh, city network uh, are going to use uh, uh, European GNSS uh, combined with inertial measurement units, for example, uh, in order to uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, the speed of the trams is uh, limited, for example, when passing over the switches, etc. So uh, uh, these advanced applications are uh, really opening the door towards uh, a larger scale deployment of uh, European GNSS. Finally, uh, the SIA project uh, is an important part uh, of uh, uh, this initiative uh, where um, uh, it is expected that uh, due to the research carried out uh, by the consortium that will be introduced to you, there will be a significant uh, reduction of uh, unscheduled maintenance activities, uh, uh, saving uh, a large portion of the maintenance costs. Uh, uh, and uh, also uh, within the four new services that will be introduced to you uh, uh, for monitoring of the wheels, uh, pantographs, uh, uh, railway track and catenary, uh, 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 there will be reduction uh, of uh, uh, around 10% in service unavailability and uh, uh, also uh, possibly uh, in uh, derailments associated to wheel uh, to rail interface failures, uh, etc. So, um, with this, um, uh, I would like to um, wish you uh, within this uh, uh, workshop uh, and the last third of the project, which is ahead of us, uh, uh, all the best, uh, uh, good luck, and uh, we are looking forward uh, for your achievements and uh, for the results. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. We'll now pass over to the next speaker, who will be Yune Alvarado, our project coordinator from it. Um, see at the Spanish Research Institute belonging to Basque Research and Technology Alliance. We're also members of the Shitter Rail joint undertaking. As the project's coordinator, you and I will now provide an overview of what the SIA project is about. Um, the floor is yours, Yuna. Okay, thank you, Madi. Okay, hello everyone, good morning. Um, thank you for being there. Thank you for participating in this very important event uh, for us. Uh, we are really looking forward to sharing with you uh, the results uh, that we are having so far in this project. And thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for your, for your words and for the, the support of the, of the agency. I hope that everyone is seeing my screen now. Um, I wanted to provide a brief overview about the, the, the project and the afterwards about the system in order to have a, a little bit of context about what we are going to talk about in this session. So this is how our consortium looks like. Um, we have a, a partners from different uh, parts of Europe, from Spain, quite a few of them, but also France, uh, UK, Germany, and, and Austria. Uh, you have them all there. Um, I guess you know most of the, of the names already, but I will go uh, briefly over them. First, we have uh, DLR, which is a very well-known space, um, uh, aerospace-related um, technology center in Germany. Then uh, we also have the, the, the UIC in France, which I'm sure uh, you already know. NSL, which is um, an EGNSS-based solution provider based in the, in the UK. We also have uh, Ingenierie Control, which is a software company, Spanish uh, software company. And uh, we have a few 
end users, kind of end users uh, in the project. First, we have uh, FGC and OBB from uh, Barcelona and Austria, uh, respectively, which are infrastructure managers, train operating companies, basically. And also Vias and Telice, which are construction companies, but also they are very active uh, offering uh, maintenance related services. So this is how um, our consortium looks like. And this is the, the, the main goal of our project is to develop for ready to use new services to provide, uh, among other things, prognostic information about the health status of some of the railways most demanding assets in terms of maintenance costs. Uh, in particular, at the point of the interaction between the vehicle and the infrastructure, the interaction between the wheelset and the rail uh, to assess the status of the wheelset and the rail and uh, from the pantograph and the catenary. As Maddy said at the beginning, uh, we are uh, developing uh, four applications, four new services uh, with the names uh, you have over here. Uh, which have uh, common features. All of them are web-based uh, applications. They provide real-time information about the health status of the relevant assets. And based on the past and the current health status, they also offer prognostic information about the, eventually the evolution of the, of the health condition of the different assets. And uh, they construct interfaces with other IT uh, systems that are used by uh, end users, other IT systems that, that are more oriented to the asset management or the maintenance operations, or things like that. In particular, we have the following um, lower level objectives. First, uh, the development of low cost sensor nodes uh, in order to monitor the, 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 the interaction between the rail and pantograph on the one hand and the catenary, uh, the, the wheel to rail, sorry, on the one hand, and the pantograph to catenary on the other hand. Afterwards, uh, another objective is to develop a data hub that collects uh, the information from sensors and also provides accurate position and time stamping uh, with high availability thanks to the EGNSS uh, systems and transmit the information to a trackside visualization platform, which is the one that hosts the four services. Then to develop a predictive component degradation models that are going to enable uh, the monitoring of the uh, and the prognostic uh, capabilities for the status of the wheel set rail, catenary and pantograph. Also to develop a visualization platform uh, in order to, to manage all the information about the, the, the assets and also um, to provide uh, visualization abilities of all the, 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 the relevant data that we are going to manage uh, in the project. And finally, uh, yeah, the development of these uh, EGNSS-driven applications uh, for the asset management in the railway domain. That is something that as uh, Daniel uh, kindly said is, is, is a very important uh, goal for, for the agent agency that is supporting us. This is uh, how the, the, the concept of the project looks like. If you see at the bottom, we will have um, a few systems, a few hardware components that are going to be installed uh, at the train that are going to be sensing the interaction between the train and the infrastructure. Uh, also, some equipment that is going to provide the, the localization capabilities, is going to integrate all the data and information coming from the sensors, and is going to send it back to a site site uh, application. And at the end of the day, this is the kind of information that we want to obtain uh, for example, for a given uh, segment uh, of the infrastructure, we want to provide data about a given KPI that you see here on the, on the y-axis uh, with regard to position on the one hand and time on the other hand. For example, if now we are here, which is uh, time zero, 
uh, we are going to be able to aggregate um, huge amounts of data thanks to the accurate uh, positioning that we are going to have. So this way we are going to um, monitor the evolution of this set of KPIs that are our focus of the project and eventually we are going to be able to deal with predictions to, 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 to see the future evolution of uh, the, the KPIs of interests and based on that information eventually to suggest uh, maintenance actions. So at the end uh, our goal is to reduce the cost of maintenance, reduce the unavailability of the assets and also to, uh, to increase the safety of the operations uh, thanks to a better condition of the assets. This is how we are organized. Uh, we have the typical uh, VPs that are related to management on the one hand and dissemination, communication and exploitation on the other hand. But uh, here at the center you see the more uh, technical stuff. First, we started with uh, the definition of the functionality of CIA system and also the architecture based on the input uh, by the end users uh, within the consortium. After that, we set all the specifications from the different subsystems and all the technical activities started. Uh, you see four uh, parallel work packages. Work package three is dedicated to uh, EGNSS systems, work package four uh, dedicated to the hardware, mainly integration of sensors, communication, energy supply for the onboard nodes. BP5 deals with the component degradation predictive uh, algorithms. And uh, BP6 uh, deals with the visualization environment uh, and the, 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 the four services. Uh, this is the point where we are now. We are finishing our activities here and we are uh, deeply involved in, in, the, in the integration of all the activities and also in the preparation of the test setup that is going to take us uh, to deliver all the systems that we are going to um, develop and also to demonstrate uh, the capabilities of the four services uh, in real operation in two different scenarios, one in Spain by FGC and the other one in Austria thanks to OBB. So that was all uh, concerning the, yeah, the a brief overview of the project. And now, Madi, I can go directly to the, to, to, to define or to, to, to provide an overview of the system in order to provide some context about the next, uh, more technical uh, discussions. Is yes, that all right? Thank you, you know. okay. Yes, um, we're running a few minutes um, late. But all right. Please proceed. Okay. This is how our system looks like. As I mentioned before, we have an onboard part of the system and trackside part of the system. And these are the names of the different subsystems that uh, compose the SIA system. First, we have SIA ABA, which monitors the interaction between the wheel and, and rail, and is composed by a set of sensors that are installed uh, in the axle box. Also, we have uh, SIA PANT, uh, which is a subsystem dedicated to monitor the interaction between the pantograph and the catenary, and also it, it consists on a set of sensors that are installed uh, on the pantograph. Then a very important part of the project, uh, the CIA POS, uh, is the positioning subsystem. Uh, it is not, not only provides the position of the train, but locates the, the data coming from the sensors, which is a very important part here. Um, it, it is composed by uh, EGNSS multi-frequency antenna and receiver, provides real-time position for event generation on board, and also uh, contains an offline position refinement uh, in order to provide a very accurate uh, position. And it's installed at the cabin and also uh, the antenna for sure on the roof. 
Then we have the SIA Data Hub, which is the one that integrates the information of all the systems on board and uh, communicates uh, this information uh, to the visualization platform on two ways. First, on real time, if anything strange happens, we generate events that provide information in real time, but also we store uh, bigger amounts of data in order to be downloaded and further processed by the visualization flat platform. And it's also installed at the cabin. And finally, we have the, the, the visualization platform, which is basically a software um, which contains the four services and is used, among other things, to visualize the different KPIs uh, in terms of the past, the present, and the, the, the future to leverage the predictive uh, capabilities. So this was the, the, the brief overview. And yeah, that was all from my side now. So I will stop sharing my screen and get back to you, Marie. Thank you very much, Unai. Um, we'll now move on to the SIA positioning system and the benefits that eGenesis brings. Um, I pass the floor over to my colleague Raman Muradi now um, from NSL. We will start with the onboard positioning system and then Michael Roth will uh, take over from DLR um, on the offline positioning system. Raman is a senior navigation engineer at NSL and Michael Roth from DLR, uh, the Ger German Aerospace Center Institute of Transportation Systems is an active researcher in the rail domain with a focus on condition monitoring and positioning. I'll pass over to you, Rami. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is, I mean, my, my, see the, my presentation and the, the voice. Can you hear that, Maddie? Yes, everything's oh, good. Yeah. Thanks, Rami. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome to, to, to the presentation. Uh, my name is Ramin Muradi from NSL. I, I'm going to cover the positioning subsystem, the, on, uh, the onboard uh, module, uh, and uh, the, the second uh, part of the presentation will be covered by Mike from DLR. So the, the topic is a uh, positioning system and the benefit of EGNSS in the, in the SIA. This is the, uh, the agenda. Uh, I'm going to like briefly uh, review uh, the objectives, main objectives of the subsystem, the positioning subsystem. And uh, uh, then the SIA architecture will be reviewed. Uh, the position requirement will be mentioned. And the uh, two section onboard and offline positioning subsystem will be uh, presented and some results will be presented as well. And eventually the conclusion will be made. <coughs> Uh, the main objective of the SIA uh, positioning system, subsystem, uh, first of all, was to select the uh, Galileo enabled low cost receiver, uh, receiver hardware. Uh, and uh, more importantly, we wanted to develop uh, an algorithm um, tailored for rail environment, specifically for SIA system. Uh, such algorithm should be multi constellation uh, based, Genesis based. Uh, positioning uh, system, uh, including eGNSS, and actually, and also we need to consider the additional sensors to 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 overcome the challenges in, that if we are facing in rail environment for positioning purpose. And also, we are going to develop uh, an offline uh, positioning refinement using map data. Uh, this slide shows the overview of SIA uh, system, which was presented before as well. Uh, so we are, we, are, we are going to have two different uh, SIA positioning subsystem, one uh, on board and the other one uh, in the back office. Uh, they have different roles. The onboard positioning subsystem uh, has lower requirements so, uh, in terms of accuracy. Uh, we are going to uh, localize the events uh, uh, real time, but with lower uh, uh, Accuracy requirements and will be passed to the uh, to the back office, which will be refined and the positioning will be improved by different techniques. Uh, the requirements are for for the different subsystem, different section of the positioning subsystem is uh, different. There are here, so we are aiming at 100% availability, uh, 20 meter horizontal accuracy at 95% confidence level for for the online or onboard positioning subsystem. And for the offline one, 
we are aiming for decimeter horizontal accuracy uh, with 95 percentile uh, confidence level. So uh, the next few slides will cover the onboard positioning part. Uh, in order to de develop the algorithm to, to deliver the requirements, we have we, we had different options uh, in terms of GNSS based positioning as well as hybrid, 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 hybridization uh, techniques. Uh, obviously, we are aiming for the high accuracy positioning, so the two main candidates are RTK or real time kinematic or PPB precise point positioning. I will explain briefly in the next slide what are the difference. And in terms of uh, using additional sensor uh, or integration with GNSS, so we had the option to use IMU uh, or odometer from train uh, and map data. So I will explain very briefly in the coming slides uh, what, what, what was our what, what was the our main preference and why we chose that. Uh, yeah, what, yeah, the RTK and PPP are the two techniques which can deliver the high precision positioning using GNSS. Uh, we, with RTK, we can achieve centimeter level positioning and PPP uh, like centimeter to decimeter positioning accuracy. But the, the main difference is that in RTK, we require uh, an, uh, a base station, not very far from the, from the user. That when we have the base station uh, or another, what, another receiver in a known, known location, we are able to remove uh, or, or mitigate most of the GNSS uh, originated errors, like uh, satellite orbit and clock errors and uh, atmospheric errors, uh, receiver clock errors, for example. So the RTK is a perfect option for high accuracy positioning, but the, uh, the, the need for having a base station uh, like close to the user, uh, or in other words, we need a network of station that makes it difficult uh, for SIOP to be used. The other option is PPP. In PPP, we received corrections, all those uh, correction errors that I mentioned, the corrections are available on either, either online or um, you can get it from the satellite via L-band L link. So that's, uh, with PPP, we can achieve uh, like the symmetry accuracy with uh, like uh, only one receiver or standalone uh, receiver, which is uh, more uh, appropriate for this uh, application. And that's why we, we, we chose PPP, but there are some challenges with PPP, uh, especially the, the convergence time. When we, when we uh, receive the signal, uh, it takes a while uh, till we converge to the desirable uh, position accuracy uh, with PPP. So like it, take, take, it will take uh, more than 10 or 20 minutes, which is not ideal. Uh, but when uh, we analyze some data, still it's, it's better. Uh, than uh, like uh, standard positioning uh, technique uh, in railway environment. That's why uh, we, we, we decided to use PPP for SIO. In terms of uh, uh, hybridization of the GNSS with IMU, <coughs> we had different options. We could choose, choose uh, GNSS positioning system, positioning algorithm plus IMU. Uh, full mechanization six degrees IMU, but uh, when we analyzed uh, and uh, reviewed some uh, all the studies, especially from RSSP, uh, we realized that this approach uh, is not good for real uh, railway environment, uh, especially if IMU is the low cost IMU. So uh, the other option is to use GNSS plus odometer in train, but unfortunately uh, we don't have uh, access to odometer uh, in SIOP. Uh, so that was the challenge. Uh, otherwise, the, the G, using GNSS plus odometer was the, the best uh, approach uh, in reliable environment. So uh, we came up with the new solution uh, for this application, which may uh, also work for other railway uh, railway application as well. We uh, try to simulate uh, the odometer measurement using uh, only a long track uh, acceleration. Uh, and we are going to use a uh, gyro measurement around, around Z axis to calculate the heading. So that is, uh, the, I think, one of the main um, innovation uh, in the positioning algorithm uh, in SIO. So this, this slide shows the uh, like a very, very, uh, in a very abstract level, uh, the positioning al algorithm. So the, the main positioning uh, algorithm will be 
based on PPP or GNSS basically. And that uh, the position from PPP will be fit to uh, the R mechanization and we estimate the velocity using the gyro and uh, acceleration along, along, the, uh, along the track and the velocity will be calculated past the PPP. So if in case we lose the measurements uh, due to like uh, bridges or signal masking, uh, the velocity will be used to propagate the, uh, the solution during the caps in order to achieve 100% availability. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, the convergence time stays an issue with PPP. So we are hoping to use uh, more, more, more when we are using more satellites, uh, including uh, Galileo. So the the length and the uh, amount of measurement gaps will be reduced, and hence uh, we will have less uh, like uh, interruption in Genesis signal. And uh, the other challenge would be. Uh, strain direction of moving. We don't have any idea uh, in the SIA system what is the direction of moving of strain. Strain can, can move forward or backward. So we need, we need to develop an algorithm to detect the direction of moving automatically, which has been done using the IMU. Uh, so we, we had planned to collect some data in train uh, in Spain to, to test the, the algorithm, uh, but unfortunately due to the COVID-19 situation, that didn't go uh, ahead. So we uh, replaced the road data uh, campaign uh, using the same hardware that we are going to use in SIA, uh, supplementary receiver, Genesis receiver, uh, IMU, UM7 inertial uh, measurement unit, which is a mass market measurement unit and uh, we use a railway certified dual antenna, dual frequency genesis antenna. To stimulate the railway environment, uh, we generate uh, measurement gaps every 10 seconds for 10 second duration. That's, that's too many, but we wanted to see the impact of uh, these uh, gaps uh, in, the, in the positioning domain. And uh, we, the, the car stopped uh, frequently uh, for one minute uh, along the road uh, to, to, to simulate the stations. So this is the trajectory of the, the data collection. We started from the NSL office in, uh, in Nottingham, uh, and we chose that uh, very straight uh, path, uh, and then co uh, come back to the office. So we had a few couple of uh, roundabouts as well. So uh, this is the, 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 the results from the SIA algorithm, positioning algorithm, as well as the PPP algorithm. The red dots uh, represent the PPP solution and the blue, lot, uh, blue dots are the PSYOP solution. Uh, clearly the PSYOP solution was able to overcome uh, the gaps, uh, like the gaps as I mentioned is 10 seconds for every 10 seconds. So we, ha we had too many gaps in these uh, GNSS gaps uh, in this uh, data set. But the, as you see, the blue line was able to uh, follow the road uh, perfectly in most cases while the PPP, because it's, PPP is using the constant spin, speed during the gap as well, was diverging when the road is not uh, straight. But we are, there are some bad solution as well, which, which is uh, in both SIA solution and PPP solution. And that was, uh, when I investigated, that was because uh, the car stopped in the hard shoulder, road hard shoulder, and when it starts moving, the, the, the heading is changing suddenly, and the, the, this algorithm was not designed for the road, that's why. We, we are hoping that we don't see that in the railway environment. Uh, so if I have a couple of slides uh, to just um, uh, show the, the impact of EGNSS in, the, in this uh, positioning system. Uh, I, I mean, in theory, we all know that Galileo has a more advanced signal structure, which can uh, resist better uh, multipath error. Multipath error is generated or caused by the reflection, signal reflection from the uh, environment. And hence, we are uh, getting a high accuracy using Galileo uh, signals. So the other uh, benefit of eGenesis is having more satellite in view, especially in relevant environment, will help us to like uh, increase the availability. So we'll have less signal masking, uh, and then uh, we'll have less signal interaction, uh, signal gaps or interruption, uh, and hence the data, the dead reckoning. Uh, will be uh, the, the divergence by the, the draconian will be uh, minimized. 
So uh, it, it is clear that you are getting benefit from the EGNSS by having more satellite and more advanced signal. So to, to show this in uh, the, the, the test, that, the data set that I presented, so we increase the elevation mask uh, in the data set, in the, in the solution generation, uh, up to a level that we, uh, we see uh, like 50% of the GNS GPS only availability. Uh, by increasing the elevation mask, actually we are not using the low satell satellite at low elevation, and we are using only the high the elevation, uh, high satellite at high elevation, which is very common in the rural environment, especially in the in the urban area. So uh, the low elevated satellite will be masked. So by raising the elevation, we have seen that uh, the GPS only solution uh, decreased by like about 50% of the uh, of the solution. So we are the, the purple dot shows that the availability impacted hugely by increasing the elevation mask, but the blue dot shows the GPS plus uh, Galileo solution. And we see that at this high elevation, still we are getting 100% avail availability, which is, uh, which is uh, very promising, uh, especially in rural environment. So uh, yeah, the next uh, part of the presentation will be covered by uh, Mike from DLR. Mike, Thank you, Ramin. I will hand over the presentation as soon as you yes. um, disable yours. I, yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, welcome everyone from my side as well. My name is Michael Roth. Uh, thank you, Ramin, for your words and the introduction. Um, I will say a few words about the back office positioning algorithms, and I will try to be brief because time has advanced a bit. So uh, what is the purpose or what is the motivation for having a, a, a separate uh, offline positioning refinement scheme in the first place? And uh, the main motivation is that uh, given batches of uh, GNSS and IMU data with all their challenges, with the varying rates and outages, uh, uh, these can be refined offline. Uh, we can exploit all sorts of context knowledge uh, um, for the uh, offline repositioning refinement, namely uh, that the vehicle is constrained to move along the railway tracks in this case. We can exploit uh, map data and we can uh, find out different things which will uh, which help us. Uh, we can use all of that information. So um, the main purpose for the positioning algorithm or uh, for the positioning data is uh, to generate georeferences for the analysis of monitoring data. So we want accurate position stamps for the analysis of uh, exabox acceleration or pantograph acceleration data. So uh, how do we go about in doing this? We exploit the offline uh, uh, knowledge to apply extensive pre-processing. Um, we separate the data into smaller units that are easier to handle and that make sense, like journeys in our case. These comprise a single sequence of motion. Uh, for each journey, we uh, know that the vehicle must have driven on a single path in the railway network. So we estimate that path first and then uh, uh, work and path coordinates using methods from the field of statistical sensor fusion, namely Kalman filters and their smoothing extensions. So all of the development that I present here or that has been carried out has been uh, performed on real data that was already connected early in the project with a Zia prototype. So, um, so what is the processing chain? Once again, uh, offline, we refine the uh, positioning data that is provided by the online system. That is, we take into account, uh, uh, oh, we process sessions of GNSS data where a session can comprise an entire measurement day. So here's a session example from our test run in Austria. It's a, a run from Vienna to the uh, very west of Austria and uh, several hours of GNSS data. We reuse the uh, IM, IMU session data. These come in at about 100 Hertz. And offline, we have uh, the entire map data available for the Austrian railway network in this uh, example here. So given uh, the session data of an entire measurement day, for instance, we first um, separated into smaller units. We are interested only in single sequences of motion. We term these journeys. And um, so for um, 
how do we go about in estimating these journeys? We look at the uh, IMU data, we look at the GNSS speed, we fuse this information and uh, bridge GNSS outages, for instance, by looking at the power in the IMU signals to separate uh, motion from standstill and to uh, separate entire measurement sessions or days into journeys. A uh, nice side effect, if we uh, have this separation into standstill data, we can also use the standstill data between journeys for uh, IMU calibration, for instance. Um, so from here on, we only work on uh, single journeys, that is single sequences of motion. And um, the first thing to note is that for a single sequence of motion that must have happened in the railway network, uh, we can estimate the path given all the position data, for instance, even if it has intermediate outages, even if it is not uh, accurate enough. So, but because you have a batch of data available, uh, it works out pretty well. That is our finding here in this. And uh, so from, so from an entire uh, uh, map data, uh, from the uh, complete map, you end up just with this single orange line, which is, is a single path that conforms with the yeah, vehicle constraints that conforms with the network topology here. So map data can be ex fully exploited. If you have the path, the positioning problem uh, is reduced, let's say from a, a 2D problem, if you want the horizontal position to a single, uh, um, to the estimation of a single distance uh, along the path. And uh, we perform that using um, Kalman filter methods um, with a dedicated, um, path constraint motion models and the respective measurement models that reflect our uncertainties. And um, because we're in an offline setting, we don't have to resort to Kalman filters only, or like, we don't have to process incoming sequences of measurements, but we can apply batch approaches here. So we uh, explore, uh, explore the use of smoothing algorithms, specifically Rauchton, Striebel Smoother, the extension of the Kalman filter in path coordinates. So what's the result? Uh, um, from uh, the GNSS session data and our new session data with their respective outages and um, intermediate uh, changes in, in uh, sampling frequency, for instance, we obtain with uh, on path positions and uh, speed with a constant rate of 100 hertz that is dedicated by if you process incoming IMU data with 100 hertz. Good. So to conclude this part of the webinar, um, a new GNSS based positioning uh, algorithm has been provided for the online part with preliminary results. Uh, further railway tests, okay, we experienced uh, some uh, delays and cancellations due to the con uh, current uh, pandemic that we are all in the current situation. So we hope to catch up uh, with. Uh, uh, further tests very soon and uh, nevertheless we have uh, worked on uh, um, an offline positioning scheme in parallel um, and that concludes my presentation and I would like to hand over to Madi. Do we Thank have time you, for a quick question? Yeah. I will leave yes. the slides like this and you can... I think... Um... Of course, we're running a little bit over time um, at the moment. Um, I've got um, some questions um, from the chat, um, and thank you very much for those. Um, we'll answer fully all the questions by the end of the session. Um, I think now we can move on to the wheel-to-rail interaction presentation, Michael. Okay. Um, so then I will um, share that presentation as well. Just a second. So, um, on to the next presentation. Uh, I will say, uh, uh, my colleague Benjamin Barsh and I will say a few words about the real rail interaction uh, content of Zia. And to bring up the architecture once again and the services. So what will we be talking about? Um, 
we will be talking about the services iWheelMon and iRailMon that uh, concern the failure monitoring of the wheels and rails specific uh, uh, respectively. About the architecture, once again, uh, I will say a few words about the onboard hardware and software that has been implemented and uh, some aspects of it. And my colleague Benjamin Barsch will uh, speak about the uh, advanced signal processing algorithms that are used to uh, evaluate these Excel box acceleration or ABA data. So, yeah, I mentioned the approach already. So. The basis for these services are high frequency Excel box acceleration data. So once again, to highlight this. So uh, some hardware details, um, every hardware uh, that has been developed within uh, ZIA uh, is for the rail use. Uh, accordingly, it must meet strict requirements and must be robust for real use. We have started with a long and strict requirement catalog in order to fulfill all of these requirements and have observed, for instance, this railway norm EN 50155 for electronic onboard equipment in several places and have chosen our components accordingly. So a bit about the setup. So once again, we do collect high frequency Excel box acceleration data. We want to uh, associate that data with faults in the wheel and in, on the tracks. So uh, the current setup uh, is uh, architecture sees, uh, 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 employs two ABA sensors, uh, Y2, one for the left wheel set, one for the right wheel set in, this, uh, in our setup. Uh, to distinguish between uh, the respective faults. It's a um, high range ac uh, accelerometer, so we have a 500G range in order to uh, capture all of the uh, high impacts as well. And uh, as I said, we collect high bandwidth data or high frequency data. In order to uh, get this uh, uh, analog output voltages of the uh, uh, accelerometers of the ABA center into computer. We use a, a suitable uh, analog to digital converter. We use an industrial PC that is railway certified. And of course, we use uh, robust rables, uh, cables and connectors and uh, also robust mounting options that um, yeah, have been uh, developed and considered in this project. About the software that we use, we use the popular software framework, Robot Operating Systems in this case. Um, it uh, provides us uh, with the ability uh, to design modular code and it is uh, um, specifically for the equation, uh, acquisition of ABA data for its analysis and for event generation to inform the end users. Um, early in the project or uh, already a year ago, uh, first prototype of this uh, ABA module was tested in a joint measurement campaign of ÖBB and DLR. Uh, ÖBB was uh, kind enough to provide their uh, measurement vehicle machine technician here, Messwagen, and uh, ZIA uh, ABA prototype uh, with a single sensor was tested here. So what you can see in this picture is uh, the machine technician Messwagen pulled by a locomotive, uh, an early prototype uh, of uh, a SIA system, and an ABA sensor on a mounting plate, on a metal mounting plate mounted to the wheel set. Um, to say a few words about the campaign, so as a, as a byproduct, we also collected positioning data, and that is maybe interesting, that uh, has been the databases for the offline positioning uh, algorithm within ZIA. And, uh, just to give you an idea of also the uh, practical work that we do here in order to mount, uh, in order to provide a self-sufficient uh, measuring device, uh, we had our own antenna mounting and uh, a specific GNSS antenna um, with a magnetic mounting construction that one of the DLR colleagues designed. So it's a magnetically mounted and it withstood the more than uh, above 200 kilometers per hour speeds that were driven. So a two week measurement campaign was performed uh, in the UBB network in June 2019. More tests to come soon, hopefully. 
uh, we drove long distance, so this is the positioning data and speed data of a single day. Speeds above 200 kilometers. We did not expect uh, experience any failures, and uh, after uh, um, uh, yeah, it, most of this time it uh, automated autonomously, and no vehicle modifications were required. And we managed to collect a solid databases for the Airbnb analysis. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Benjamin, and we'll stop my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael, and hello, everybody. Um, start sharing my screen. All right, um, before I delve into the data analysis uh, part, I just want to highlight what kind of failures we are uh, investigating when we are talking about wheel and rail health uh, monitoring. On the wheel side, we are looking at classical failures um, such as uh, wheel flats, as you can see here on the top left side, this is a very severe example. You can find this on Wikipedia, but we are also looking into polygonization or any kind of defect where the actual wheel diameter deviates from the nominal condition. On the rail side, we are mainly looking at short track defects. So um, defects occurring from rolling contact fatigue, such as squats, as you can see here on the, on the top figure, but also um, into corrugation. Okay, let's start with a, a wheel monitoring analysis approach. Uh, on the top left hand side here, uh, you can see um, raw data from our ABA system. So from the Exabox acceleration, this is a vertical component and this is just raw data in the time domain. So what we can see here is a typical wiggly line um, with, with some spikes at uh, certain positions. What we can do now is we can look at the data in a time frequency representation. We can do this by applying a short term Fourier transform and we get this uh, figure below. Here we have the time now on the x axis and the frequency uh, on the y axis. And we see we have some um, yeah, prominent vertical lines at some positions. They occur at the same positions as the spikes in the time domain. And these are quite uh, transient events which are more likely. Um, related to some track irregularities. We can also see some horizontal bands that occur at all times and they um, represent the natural frequencies of the, of the system, of the wheel, of the rail, of the axle and so on. And these frequencies are excited um, all the time when the train is uh, traveling. But this is not what we are actually um, interested in here. We are interested in the impact of the wheel and to reveal this information, we have to zoom in a little bit more. And this is what we see here on the top right figure. So here we have the same uh, spectrogram, the same time frequency um, representation, but we are only looking at the first 200 Hertz. And now we see these lines and these lines represent uh, the repetitive pattern of, uh, of the wheel. So they correspond uh, to the revolution frequency of the wheel. And if we assume that no wheel is perfectly round or the surface is perfectly flat, each wheel has a certain footprint and this footprint repeats um, every time the, the wheel revolutes. So there's, um, there's an impact at these frequencies. And these uh, lines here represent the different harmonics of this repetitive pattern. And the difference between uh, these, these lines here uh, in Hertz is equivalent to the number of uh, revolutions of the wheel per second. You can also see that these frequencies here are increasing, and this is exactly where the vehicle, where the train is uh, increasing the speed. So because when we go with higher velocity, the, the wheel is turning faster, so the frequency increase. So we can see that, that the impact of the wheel is in, uh, in the data, and now we want to um, extract a feature that um, gives us the information we see here in this, in this line in, in a more or less single feature. And what we do, we, we can collapse all these lines by applying an inverse Fourier transform. And because we are here looking at the logarithmic amplitude spectrum, 
we get uh, a so-called capstone by applying the inverse Fourier transform. And normally we would uh, transform the frequency back into time. Um, this is what the inverse Fourier transform does. But at this point, we use uh, the speed information from the GNSS data to convert the speed into a distance. And what we get at the figure here on the lower right side, and now we see here that we have collapsed all these lines into one single peak. And this peak occurs exactly at the distance equivalent to the circumference of the, um, uh, of the wheel. So now we have a nice feature, a very robust feature, which can help us on one hand to monitor um, the, the circumference or the diameter of the wheel by the location of this peak. And we can also monitor the amplitude of this peak, which is a good indication for the severity of a wheel flat, for instance. Okay, let's talk now about the rail monitoring. Here on the right-hand side, we see the processing sequence um, uh, uh, we apply to the ADA data for extracting features uh, for the rail monitoring. And um, again, we use um, time frequency transformation, um, looking at um, logarithmized amplitude spectrums. This is what we see here again on the lower left-hand side. And in this domain, we have the possibility to remove the background noise, um, which I have explained before, these horizontal lines, which correspond to the natural frequencies, and we are not interested in this. We want to highlight now these um, transient events, for instance, here. So once we have removed this uh, background noise, we can transform the data uh, into, from the time frequency domain into a distance wave number domain. Why are we doing this? Because when we want to characterize um, track defects, um, we are not interested of the duration or the frequency of the defect. We are interested in the spatial domain, so in the lengths or um, the, the wavelengths of the, of the track, especially if we think about something uh, like corrugation. So uh, this is why we do this transformation. And in this uh, domain, then we can extract features to characterize um, our uh, track defects. So here again, we see um, the um, logarithmic amplitude spectrum. And this is how it looks like after removal of the, the background noise. We also remove the, the wheel signature. In this case, when we are looking at the rail, the, what was signal before becomes now noise. So we want to remove this and we can see that some events are more striking now. And now we can um, extract different uh, features, uh, namely the amplitude and different uh, wave number bands. So again, the wave number is a uh, reciprocal of uh, the wavelengths or the uh, frequency in the spatial domain. And we can see that um, some, at uh, some positions, for instance, uh, here at the, the, the strong event here at the beginning, more, uh, mainly lies in the high wave number bands. So very short wavelengths indicating a short uh, track irregularity. All right, um, to conclude, um, I can say that um, we have um, developed and tested uh, robust um, hardware and software for our ZEA um, IBA system. We have tested it and, uh, and demonstrated it in an operational environment, as uh, Michael has mentioned before. We've also shown that uh, georeference IBA data is very promising for real rail interaction. Here, uh, the georeferencing is not only necessary for track selective positioning, but also provides us um, an accurate um, speed information, which is uh, necessary for our analysis. The real and rail health status monitoring algorithms we have developed um, were also tested on these real world data. And as also mentioned before, um, further testing campaigns are in preparation. We are a little bit um, delayed on this due to COVID-19, but um, we are hoping that we get uh, nice and more data in the future with our system. Okay, that's me for now, and I stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Benjamin and Michael. Um, I think we'll now pass the floor back over to Unai Alvarado from SEAT, who will cover the system uh, that monitors the pantograph uh, to catenary interaction. Um, Unai, please, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Maddy. I hope everyone is seeing my screen now. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, I will I will talk now about the CIPAN, which is kind of similar to in, in functionality uh, with regards to just what Michal and, and Benjamin uh, have been presenting before, but our approach has been slightly uh, different. Our goal is to develop an onboard system, uh, for sure, and algorithms on the pantograph to monitor its uh, interaction with the catenary for a, a given set of, of, of KPIs. Uh, for that for that purpose, we we faced uh, a few challenges. Uh, first, uh, which KPIs? Because uh, for sure, um, to assess the interaction of the, the the wheel set and the rail and pantograph and the catenary, you can monitor many things, but we have to focus on on a on a on a target set of KPIs, and these KPIs were provided at, at the beginning of the project in in Viva two. Afterwards, uh, to, to, to monitor these KPIs, what sensors uh, do we have to use? Where do we want to install, in, install them? And finally, what kind of data set uh, um, may we have in order to work out the algorithms to uh, go from the sensor data to the relevant information to the end user? So this is the methodology that we have been uh, following. First, uh, we perform uh, the characterization of the, of the pantograph, how it is, how it behaves, in order to, to model uh, its performance. Also, we want to model the, the catenary in order to combine the two models uh, into a virtual framework, sort of, uh, let's say, digital, digital twin approach that assesses the interaction between the pantograph and the catenary. With that information, uh, we are in a better position to design the system, I mean, to, to, to decide what sensors to use, where to put them. And once we have decided that, and with the help of this virtual framework, uh, we develop algorithms in order to assess the, the health status of, the, of these assets. Uh, we also were able to generate a, a data set using this virtual framework like uh, a data set that we might expect, for example, using real data. Um, and finally, uh, system development uh, in order to uh, install in the train and acquire uh, real data. Well, first, as I mentioned before, uh, we went to the, to the workshop with our colleagues at FGC. Uh, disassemble a uh, pantograph which is uh, relevant to the use case that we are facing um, and perform a set of tests there. We, we, we brought uh, up to 15 sensors, I think. We placed them everywhere. They were accelerometers, displacement sensors, force sensors, uh, tilt sensors, so on, with a very high grade uh, signal acquisition equipment in order to characterize the behavior of the pantograph, both uh, statically and uh, dynamically. Once we have this, um, we model the pantograph following uh, two parallel approaches. First, we did a, a theoretical model of the, of the pantograph, uh, access to its kinematics and stuff like that and also a multi-body model of this pantograph, which is a more precise and accurate version of the, of the, of the pantograph uh, that takes into account its, for example, its, its dynamics in a more realistic uh, way. The goal uh, for that is to uh, build a lumped mass, uh, mass uh, model, which is uh, a simple model is, is not this model for sure, it's a more complicated one. But as I will mention uh, later on, uh, we want to provide a, a, a lumped mass model, which is the most uh, accurate uh, possible in order to introduce it uh, in the virtual framework to assess its interaction with the pattern with the catenary. Um, 
Then we, we model the catenary. We model the catenary uh, theoretically in a, a general perspective. Also, we, the, one of the tricky parts is to solve the initial position of the catenary. We particularized uh, the, the, the characteristics of this catenary to the, to the use case that we are working with. Uh, in this case, the catenary that FGC is, is using. And um, yeah, in the, in, the, in the figure on the bottom here, we can see the, the initial position, once uh, solved, of the catenary for uh, two wires. We are dealing with one wire for the overhead contact wire and two wires. And here on the, on the right, we also introduce in the model um, some kind of randomness um, yeah, in order to have a more realistic model. Once we have the pantograph model and the catenary also model, we combine them uh, together in order to assess uh, its performance uh, and validate them uh, with, the, with the relevant standards that are used for this matter, which is the EN50318 uh, in this case. Here you can see a simulation uh, with one pantograph contacting with the overhead contact wire. Uh, which is the, this uh, square over here. Uh, let's see the, the evolution of the contact point. And here at the bottom left, you have the contact force and how it, it evolves with the time, and also the evolution of this uh, contact point. This model has been uh, validated. And up to now, it's suited for, not for high speed, uh, but for speeds up to 260. Uh, kilometers per hour. It is fine. It's a, it's a 2D model, not a 3D one. With all that taken into account, uh, we were in the position of uh, designing our system that in this case is composed by three sensors, one tilt meter and two accelerometers. And also uh, with all the electronics uh, that take the inputs uh, from these sensors um, and send them to the uh, to the data hub that um, in, in a similar way as uh, Michael had presented before for the CIA ABA. This system is autonomous, is, is uh, uh, powered by a, by a battery in order to warranty the electrical isolation. Then uh, with this uh, system and with our virtual framework, we can generate uh, virtual signals in the same way that we might expect them uh, with the real sensors uh, that, we, that we are using. And these are the relevant KPIs that we are targeting here. Uh, we are facing the overhead contact wire geometry, overhead contact wire uh, wear, and also the contact force, the displacement of the contact point, and any shock impacts or otherwise uh, due to um, extraordinary events happening with the interaction of the pantograph to catenary. And this is the kind of information that we are dealing with. Uh, this in blue, we see the evolution of one of the KPIs. In this case, uh, it is the, the, the wear, maximum wear in millimeters. And this is the, the inferred data. Uh, this the, the orange uh, line, you see the, the, the limit for this KPI. This is, this is purely qualitative. And this is the information that we are dealing with. We are doing a prognosis, which is uh, this mean value here, and uh, the plus, plus and minus uh, three sigma deviations in order to see when we might, uh, we might uh, surpass the given threshold and when we are uh, probably having uh, problems in the future. Also taking advantage of this uh, virtual framework, uh, we are generating um, faulty signals and like real, real, real scenario like uh, signals um, of the sensors that we are uh, using in a real uh, scenario. So we can play with this data, basically, and we can generate um, 
different kind of cases. We can replicate different uh, operating conditions. We can replicate uh, different kind of failures and uh, try to observe what, what happens and try to work uh, with the algorithms and try to um, predict stuff. So this is uh, an example of the, the, the mean uh, of the overhead contact wire where uh, using one wire on the, on the, on the, on the two figures, uh, upper figures, and with two wires on the bottom figures. So you see the differences between the, the, the true values and the predictive values. And this is the, the quality of the prediction uh, based on the different uh, observations that we, that we made. So finally, with all that, uh, we have designed the, the, the system using uh, accelerometers and field meters with a, with, a, uh, with a logging device and the different ancillary equipment uh, to install uh, everything on the pantograph using for sure railway rated uh, cables, uh, uh, connectors and stuff like that in order to send it back to the data hub which is also a railway rated uh, industrial PC. So similar approach that the one showed by DLR uh, a few minutes ago. So I was uh, a little brief, uh, this was all from my side. Uh, if, we if, we if, if you have any questions, I think that we can recover them uh, at the end of the session. So back to you, Mari. Yes, thank you, and I thanks very much. Um, our next presenter is Jose Manuel Martin, who works for the Spanish uh, techni uh, technology company Inji Control, uh, where he is R&D technology transfer manager. Jose will be explaining and showing the SI visualization platform. So, Jose, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Madi. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you, Madi, for your kind introduction. Uh, so we have uh, seen in the previous presentation by my colleagues uh, the different uh, positioning and, and monitoring on board equipment that we are developing in the SIA pro, uh, project, uh, but uh, to enable our end users to exploit fully all the uh, information and benefits provided by this onboard equipment, uh, we need a visualization platform, which is the the end user interface and that is what uh, we are going to see in my presentation during the first uh, 15 minutes more or less. Uh, this is the agenda. Uh, first I will introduce the objectives of the visualization platform developed in SIA, the functionalities that we have uh, wanted to provide to the system, the architecture and the software framework we have used for the development and then uh, the most interesting I think uh, we will see a, a, a demo video and we will have time at the end, hopefully, this time in this presentation for questions and, and, and answers, hopefully. So uh, our objective has been creating a, a user interface for railway infrastructure and vehicles maintenance, uh, which supports uh, the georeference data provided by EGNSS. Uh, First, we needed to establish with what uh, kind of, of views are useful for the prospective end users of the SIA system uh, uh, to manage the, the maintenance uh, issues of infrastructure and, and, and vehicles, and which are able to support uh, past and, and, and future degradation status of the, of the different components. The second is to select a, a software framework able to uh, support these, uh, these interfaces and obviously implement those views. And uh, finally, and we are on that a bit uh, behind schedule because of the COVID-19 situation, that our end users in the consortium uh, customize and, and start using this uh, visualization platform. Uh, in the end, the system is a web portal which gives access to the four applications as we see in the bottom image of this uh, slide. I cut one for the catenary, I pant one for the pantograph, I will mount for the wheel set, and I, I rail mount for the railway track. So the functionalities that we are providing with the SIA visualization platform uh, is the ability to manage a list of components and associated KPIs, as well as the associated parameters, limits, and, and thresholds. 
to manage a maintenance activities list associated with, this, with each of those KPIs and components uh, to advise uh, the users on the actions to do based on the KPIs status. Uh, obviously, to display uh, all the all the assets managed by our users in a geographical information system in a in a map, thanks to the uh, georeference data, and also uh, raw auscultation and, and inspection data provided by the onboard equipment developed in SAIA and also by uh, by external by external systems, which is also displayed in in, in a map uh, view. Uh, well, based on the, all the information, obviously, uh, provide the current status of the of the components based on the on the KPIs that we calculate, and the prediction of the of the future status of those of those components, uh, how the KPIs will evolve in in time if no action no maintenance actions are are taken, and the uh, well uh, help our end users providing uh, warnings uh, in advance. Uh, to prevent uh, future failures and maintenance recommendations to prevent those uh, those failures. So the challenges that uh, we have to to overcome with the visualization platform uh, is that we have to provide a ubiquitous uh, user interface because our end users can be in the office or, or also in the uh, in the field. This uh, does not only mean that they can access from different places, but also with a different kind of, uh, of devices. Also, security is a very important issue because we are dealing with a very critical uh, infrastructure. Also, rapidity and associated with that uh, scalability, we have to manage a very huge amount of, of, of data uh, which are uh, continuously received uh, by the system and display that uh, to the end users uh, in a fast and, and, and efficient way. Also, interoperability uh, is another uh, key challenge that we have to, to face because we have to interact with uh, other uh, external uh, IT software, which is already in use by our end users, uh, both for the assets and also, as we will see in the, in the demo, for uh, monitoring information provided by, by other external sources, as for example, auscultation uh, reports. And also, <clears throat> we want the system to be uh, open source, not only because it is, this is a, a project funded by with public funds, because also uh, because we want to avoid the vendor lock in the vendor locking in the future. Uh, but obviously, when we use open source technologies, we have to select those which are uh, mature, widely used, and which have a vibrant community, which uh, ensures support uh, for a long for a long time. So, what I have advanced uh, before, uh, the visualization system has been developed with an as a web-based platform with a typical client-server architecture in three layers. We have the the database about we, which we will talk in the next slides, the application server, and our end users uh, connect uh, via internet. Uh, using different types of devices, depending if they are in the office or if they are uh, in the field performing maintenance actions. So about the software stack, uh, I want to highlight uh, that after different te uh, tests based on, on load and, and, and performance, uh, we selected as a database for the, for the SIA system, uh, an SQL database, PostgreSQL. Uh, we tested a uh, software package extension, which is called uh, PostGIS, which support uh, very efficiently uh, georeference uh, data and the amount of uh, data that uh, we expect uh, to receive uh, based on the on load tests with uh, data from our end users in the in the project. And uh, related to the mapping framework, uh, we have selected the maps which are available uh, as open source in a map repository called OpenStreetMaps and uh, to display them in the in the visualization platform we are using a javascript library which is called uh, leaflet. Uh, we think that uh, with this uh, database and with this uh, mapping framework uh, SIA 
becomes a powerful geographical information system solution, uh, which is uh, supported by uh, well-established uh, open source technologies. And uh, we are not going to depend on the future, for example, on tariffs fixed by Google for using Google Maps, which uh, in the past few years have increased uh, dramatically for this type of, of applications with a, which expect a, a heavy, a heavy uh, load by the users. So now let's go with the demo. So the users, uh, after providing valid uh, credentials, are able to access to the system. We can see the four services that we have already mentioned, and we are focused. The, we are going to focus the, the demo on, on ICAT Mon and the catenary. The landing page is a map where we locate all the assets. In this case, we are using a metropolitan line in the city of Barcelona provided by FGC. On the top left, we have the administration menu uh, where we can manage uh, users, translations, and also uh, the configuration of the system. In this case, we can see the different failure modes and, and associated KPIs for the wires in the catenary. We can see all the, uh, the catalog of all the failing modes. We are currently using the last five uh, ones. And if we go to the contact wire where, about which uh, Unai has already talked to us in this, this presentation, uh, we can see that the user can uh, set up the, the measurement and the different uh, limits uh, to assess the, the status of the, of, the wear, of the contact wire. If we go back to the assets menu, uh, here we have the ability to create components and locate them in the map in the, in the inventory. So if uh, we zoom in on the line we had already seen, we can see the positioning of the different uh, stations and how it, this metropolitan line goes by the city. We can see the, the UTM coordinates of, the, of that particular stretch of, of, of wire. And we can see the, the two tracks. We can quickly uh, access to the details of the of the component in this case the wire with the location and the manufacturer and we can also visualize the information uh, in a table mode instead of uh, in a in a map in this case we are only focusing on the track two of the railway line if we go to the monitoring menu uh, here we can see the current historical and predicted values uh, predicted by the CIA on board uh, equipment. If we go to the current, we are going to see the latest values uh, loaded in the system by the by the onboard equipment, in this case by the equipment presented by, by UNI. So at this zoom level we can see the the different uh, the color legend which highlights us the worst value in each of the stretches that we can distinguish in this uh, in this zoom level if we zoom in we can go to see even the individual individual measurements on the on the map which are provided by the onboard equipment with the UTM coordinate and the in this case the contact wire height and the contact force as the as the KPIs and a recommended action which is uh, general maintenance as there is no uh, no important event highlighted yet. We can see the, the information in a, in a table format with different uh, filtering options. In this case, we only have data of the track one and also in, in charts in, a, in the graph uh, mode. In this case, as we saw in the map, we have uh, two KPIs, the contact force and the contact wire height. In the contact force, we can see the, the different thresholds that uh, we saw configured in the administration menu. In the case on the contact wire height, we can see the chart blank because there was no, uh, no thresholds uh, created yet by the user. We can see the measures in the and zoom in and out using the mouse wheel. If we go to the report section, it's very similar to the monitoring section. 
Uh, but in this case, we are seeing information provided by external systems uh, that we can that we give the ability to load in 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 SIA. In this case, we are going to see a catenary occultation information uh, that can be configured and loaded in the in the system, even if it is provided by a by a by a by external source, not uh, developed in in SIA. Uh, the behavior is similar to what we saw in, in, in monitoring. Where we can zoom in and uh, access to the, to the individual measurements. Uh, you can see red points in this case, but uh, don't worry. You can take this metropolitan line with, uh, without any concern. Uh, it is that we just uh, put very strict limits so that we could see more uh, colors displayed in the in the map. And if we access to any <coughs> to an individual point, we can see the coordinates of the the geo reference coordinates of the point, and the, in this case the where the height and the centralization provided by the by the occultation report. Similarly to to the information provided by the sea onboard equipment, we can see the information in a table format and and also in a in a graph. And finally, in the event section, uh, we can see uh, warnings raised by the onboard equipment and immediately uh, sent uh, to the end users uh, via the visualization platform. Uh, every time the, the onboard equipment detects a, 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 a strange event on the on the train. It sends the information to the to the back office and it is immediately displayed in this uh, in this table, where the user can acknowledge the information received and double clicking on it directly, uh, uh, the the map pops up with the point where the where the event has been raised. In this case, with a recommendation to investigate further uh, about the evolution in the monitoring in the monitoring menu. And that was all for the demo video. And if I go back to the presentation, this was my last uh, slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I hope that uh, you have uh, liked what you have seen. Um, Madi? Thank you, Jose. Thanks very much. And thank you to all presenters. Um, We've now got the opportunity to go on to the Q&A part of the session. So I'll share my screen now. Um, a lot of uh, the questions that have been raised have been answered in the chat. Um, so thank you very much um, for that. Um, if there's any questions um, that anyone's got at this point, um, please feel free um, to, answer, uh, to ask anything you'd like. Any questions at this point? Madi, do, do you want uh, to go through the previous questions if there is no new questions or how do you want to proceed with that? Yes, we can go through the previous questions. Because there, I think there were uh, a few of them that were related to the, to the positioning, uh, which uh, I think it's a, a very important part in the, in the project. And yes, yeah. Yeah, they provide uh, quite a high interest among the participants, I guess. Yes, maybe Ramin or Michael, do you want to go through the target performance for the positioning um, a little bit? I know there were several questions on that. Yeah, we, we can uh, say a few words about these. Uh, maybe you start with the first one and I'll take the jamming one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, regarding the, uh, the requirements, I mean, for onboard system, 
uh, they are targeting 20 meter horizontal uh, accuracy. Uh, the reason for this low requirement is that, that that will be used only for the event localization and at real time. If, if something uh, if something uh, more interesting happens, so uh, someone will go there and just visually inspect the location and find the problem. Uh, so uh, we are not like, um, the, the, the requirement is not defined such like uh, cross track or along track components. But uh, in the back office, the, the position will be refined uh, yes. to the level. Which, uh, yeah. We are in a way in a lucky position to uh, uh, investigate GNSS and uh, Galileo and positioning algorithms in general for a uh, service. And the service here in this case is either to georeference online events or to georeference the uh, measurement data collected by monitoring sensors for offline analysis. So uh, in that way, we are quite lucky. So Ramin already said a few words about the, the online accuracy and how it is to be interpreted. And I can add a few more words about uh, the offline accuracy and how it um, relates to some of the questions. So first of all, in, in the offline processing, we do uh, work on batches of data and we uh, estimate the path in the network first and foremost. So um, in that respect, there is no uh, um, cross track or a long track accuracy any longer because um, it is assumed that a single path has been estimated. And um, of course, questions might arise whether it is always possible to uh, estimate a single path. And uh, uh, it looks promising. And uh, if no single path can be uh, uh, found, that is something that we can realize and then we can work on several path hypotheses. For instance, if uh, there are very long GNSS outages in uh, uh, some regions, but the experiences that we have collected here show that, okay, estimating the path separately for a single journey is actually very promising. Um, relating it to uh, spoofing and jamming, if a sp uh, jammer is uh, placed somewhere on the vehicle, that is a critical issue. So, and that is uh, not directly addressed here, but uh, that is something that is uh, uh, a concern in the railway GNSS position in, in general. If a jammer is placed along the track somewhere, it would produce a GNSS outage, and these outages are similar to outages caused by bridges, tunnels, etc. Uh, um, we are aware of them, and these are addressed in the offline part and uh, in the online with a, a, a mechanization or with a complementary sensors and the dead reckoning approach as well. Yeah. Um, a few few more, more questions, I mean, just come up in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding PPP and PPP solution will be used for onboard uh, section and uh, we are going to use the correction, uh, uh, the open source corrections, uh, mainly from CNES uh, provider, uh, which will be received by, e by internet, and the position will be passed to the, to the back office for uh, further refinement. Uh, other sensors, uh, yeah, we are using IMU for onboard as well as for back office uh, one, uh, as I mentioned before. Regarding uh, uh, number of constellations, the target is GPS and Galileo uh, for the moment, uh, but we, 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 we left the possibility of using other constellation option, uh, open as well, uh, but uh, for, for, for this stage, we are considering only GPS plus Galileo. Uh, I think there's no more, more question regarding positioning. Well, there were actually uh, two remarks. So one was about uh, the publication of results. Mm -hmm. And um, so parts of the results are being written up. And so there is also um, publication planned for the uh, offline processing change. And the experience that we collected within the year is definitely planned. Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can even, uh, or it is planned that parts of the software are being made available to users, but uh, that is something that still requires more work. But we hope to do that within the year. Yeah. To add that to, to, to that, 
I should mention that we, we, we published a paper in ICL conference, Finnish conference, uh, just uh, in a work in progress uh, track. Uh, there's a plan to publish paper in the INGNSS as well as in uh, European Navigation Conference uh, soon. So you can follow those publications. Uh, all of them are titled with SIA uh, positioning uh, subsystem. And just one more tiny detail about the questions, if any GNSS corrections. Um, so the offline positioning part assumes a GNSS user perspective in the sense that we rely on intermediate accurate observations from the online system and reprocess them for, uh, in the offline framework. So, but that in turn means that in principle, any other GNSS offline refinements can be applied without changes to the processing framework that we use here. The sense of fusion framework that has been adopted uh, is uh, even uh, as flexible so as to include further, let's say, speed sensors or others. Did we miss anything else, Ramin, or from, I from the think, audience, perhaps, I Maddie? think we covered everything, so if... Yeah, I think we've got everything on positioning. Um, there was one question on business model. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you want to address that. Mm. Sorry, Madi, uh, repeat it again. Um, there was one question uh, from uh, Marco um on what the business model will be for the system um, yes this is this to is, be determined but if you want to say a few words yeah well this is uh, we don't know yet i mean we we have some some ideas uh, perhaps uh, towards the, the 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 second of the options i mean to sell the service uh, not the system but the service but in fact, we have a, a, dedicated, a dedicated task uh, to it that is, uh, in fact, starting now. Uh, and we will have, uh, until the end of the, of the project, uh, to, to work this very, very aspect. Uh, in fact, um, what we want to do is to, to talk to the industry, to talk to the end users. I mean, what, what is their feedback? about what is the, mm -hmm. the, the best characteristics that they might expect uh, by one of such systems and also what is the best way to collaborate in terms of, of service, either to, to, to buy a system like that and forget about it or either to buy uh, uh, the, 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 the service. I think that the second one is uh, more suitable in my opinion, but uh, is not decided yet. I mean, it's part of the last uh, stage uh, at the project, and I guess that the industry partners uh, in the consortium will will have a, a stronger opinion uh, about this, this this matter, but not decided yet. I think there were some uh, questions about the pantograph acceleration analysis and how to end up at the. Yes, I, I answered them in the in the in the chat. Uh, the questions were related to the wear of the overhead contact wire, and it was it was tricky because yes, I presented uh, an architecture based on sensor sensors, but um, as one question by Peter uh, Eppelhoff uh, said that if if we have validated these results uh, in the field, no, we haven't. Um, hopefully, we are going to do it soon. Uh, uh, we wanted to do it earlier, but due to this uh, COVID-19 situation, uh, this kind of testing um, uh, campaigns uh, have been necessarily postponed. Uh, what we have done is to, to replicate in this virtual framework the kind of signals that we might expect from real sensors. So this way, we, we, we are able to play uh, with the environment um, to, to modify, for example, the overhead contact wire, 
or the different parts of the catenary or the characteristics of the, of the pantograph to play with it and generate uh, virtual signals that are the kind of signals that we might expect with uh, real sensors. So this way, this way we have been working with the, with the algorithms, but we haven't used a, a real data set um, obtained with real measurements uh, yet. We, we, we hope to do it uh, very soon. So in, in that respect, maybe you saw some of the experiments were postponed within Zia, but um, mm -hmm. lots of the uh, work was actually performed on data from the field. So, uh, for instance, the Exabox acceleration data du uh, collected during the campaign with uh, UBB and DLR, and um, yeah, parts of the positioning data for the offline positioning algorithms, and uh, yeah, experiments were carried out on real data, not from the target uh, environment though, but from a related environment as at NSL as well. I think there's a question on uh, more details on deliverables. Um, maybe we can follow up um, after the event, you go with, uh, with further details on that. Um, yes, I guess, that I, do, I don't remember, uh, Christine, if we have the deliverables, uh, the, the list of deliverables published uh, in our website. I guess that all the public deliverables will be there uh, once they are uh, conveniently uh, approved by our reviewers and by the DSA, so everyone can access them and download them. Uh, not the confidential ones, as you might uh, expect. But I, I would encourage you, if you want any um, um, specific ask or any specific uh, interest about something that is very technical, uh, please uh, follow up and, and, and reach out to, to us and we can uh, put you in contact with the relevant people in order to start a, a technical discussion if you, if you want. Yes, you can, uh, Benjamin here again, um, you, you can find the deliverables on, the, on our homepage. There are already some public deliverables you can download for instance, on the end user requirements and also on the SIA architecture. And, and uh, this is Christine. I'll check uh, later if there is a list and if there is not, I will put one. I cannot access the, the website now. Yeah, the list is there. If, you, um, if anyone has got any questions, there is a contact us module at the bottom of the website, the very bottom of the page. And that you could use that as well uh, to contact the team. So there, there is, there is a, another question uh, from Peter Eppelhoff. Uh, yeah, the, 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 this, this webinar is being recorded, so hopefully we will upload it uh, to our website. This might be a good opportunity to thank also all the listeners and uh, yeah, good to see so many participants and interesting questions and uh, also read about some familiar names in the, uh, from the field, in the uh, participant list. So thank you. Um, Yes, definitely. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you. Okay, so if we are no further questions, shall we close the event uh, here, Madi, Christine? Let's, uh, let's take a picture first. Sorry? Let, let's take a, pic a picture first. Okay. <laughs> Can you all turn your camera on so that we can take a picture? <laughs> wow, this is being great. 
see so many faces, real people. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone thank you so thank you everyone and please don't hesitate to following up with us uh, if you are interested in any topic that we have been discussed about just reach you out you, um, you, you have the contact details in our website you can email me or Christine and we will uh, forward you to the to the relevant people and nothing else to say Thank you very much for your participation and for the very interesting questions that made us think about very interesting topics. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.